Well, welcome back. This week we're going to be learning about reading comprehension, which is chapter six in your textbook. So let me go ahead and open up my slideshow. Oh, I guess I have to share my screen with you first. All right, there we go. All right, I have built in the videos that we will be using um, as if we were teaching in class uh, normally. So uh, there'll be parts of this that have those video clips um, integrated as well. So welcome to Reading Comprehension. So after we've reviewed this chapter um, and you've read it in your book, you should be able to explain reading comprehension concepts, determine factors that impact comprehension instruction, describe motivation for literacy engagement, analyze comprehension instruction in the Common Core State Curriculum, apply comprehension strategies for children's literature, and also demonstrate literacy strategies and practices for reading comprehension. So when we take a look at comprehension, um, it's defined as the process of constructing meaning using both the author's text and the reader's background knowledge for specific purposes. Um, so if you're reading something and you have no context about what it's talking about, you're going to have a really hard time comprehending. So in class, we've talked about the word escalator before that um, if you do not live in a location that has two story buildings with an escalator, you don't have experience with that to know that if that word were to come up, that you would have any kind of meaning um, associated with it. So like here in Dothan, we've decided that there's only one place with an escalator and that is in Dillard's at the mall. So if you've never been in there, you might not know what that means. So even though somebody might say that word, you're not able to connect uh, that word with an actual meaning in your head. Um, so for us to be able to um, have good comprehension, we have to think about what's in the text. So it's not just knowing the words on the page, but making a mental picture of what that means. So we have two types of readers. Um, the first type of reader is going to be the person who is able to read and understand and communicate ideas based on what they're reading because they do have that background knowledge and that ability to read the text. So maybe in early childhood, we're looking at students who aren't able to read the words yet, but they're able to understand the words that are read to them. The second type of reader is the person who doesn't have that comprehension skills, but they're word callers. So they're able to read the word, say the word, but they don't have that connection to a word meaning. So they can uh, read the words all in a sentence, but they don't have that, that connection to the meaning to add to the comprehension. So for us to be good readers, we have to have different qualities. So the very first one is thinking about thinking. Um, I have to be able to think during the reading process. So I'm reading something and something is being conjured up in my mind. So I'm able to um, picture it and understand what's going on. So that's metacognition. Um, they have to be able to use strategies while reading to know what they're comprehending. So some of those are predicting, summarizing, inferring. So if I'm reading a story about um, the monster at the end of this book, that's a really fun story with Grover. And um, I'm thinking for each page, he's getting more worried and worried that there's a monster at the end of the book. And I, in my mind, have to know that a monster would be something to be worried about. And I start predicting what's going to happen. So I'm able to use some of my comprehension strategies to help me move further along with what's going to happen. And lastly, um, again, we use all the three language queuing systems automatically. I don't have to think about them. So just to re-familiarize yourself with those three different language queuing systems, we have a um, graphonic queuing system, and that is um, the symbol and how the word sounds. So think about the phonics. So it's kind of like the picture of the word. Um, and then we have semantics, which is uh, what represents meaning of a word. So if you think back again at last week's lesson where children had the semantics, the, the words that they were um, categorizing, we had the word large, but they had lots of different words and they had to categorize them um, from smallest to biggest. So they were talking about that word meaning. Um, and then we also have the synatics, 
which is the word order or sentence structure. So those are all things that I need to already know so that I can get comprehension out of what I'm reading or being read. Um, so for an example, um, we have our story Make Way for Ducklings. So this would be the book that I would read out loud to you, though that is in my classroom and um, I don't have access to that at the moment. Um, but I wanna use these thinking aloud strategies. So if I'm reading this book, Make Way for Ducklings, I want to have children um, develop a mental picture. I want them to be creating something in their mind. So before I even start the book, I might talk about um, our five senses as they deal with ducks. So I might think about what sound does a duck make and have children be able to uh, tell me that. How does a feather feel and have them describe that? And then as we go through the story, they can then um, not only have that mental picture that I'm talking about as we read the book, or we've talked about before we even started, but also now they've got a crayon and they're drawing a part of the book. And then really at the end, you can end up doing lots of activities for that where they can put their pictures in order uh, for how the story goes based on their own mental images. Um, so for effective comprehension instruction, it involves breaking up complex concepts into key ideas. So before teaching any lesson on a topic, teachers must um, make sure their students are familiar with the content and concepts. So we want to introduce new vocabulary prior to actually um, reading a story or getting into that concept. That way that they, uh, when we get to using those words, they know what they mean. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that can affect a child's comprehension. And these are um, a list of a lot of them. So um, looking at these lists of factors, just know that they influence how children understand what they're reading. Children comprehend the different perspectives depending on their culture, their language, and prior knowledge. So teachers have to assess their students' oral reading and decoding skills through running records and retellings to make sure they matched, they're matched to appropriate texts. So, we need to make sure that we are teaching children using text that they can understand and that they can read. So that's really important. Decoding is using word identification strategies to pronounce and attach meaning to unfamiliar words. Reading levels tend to change often in the early years. So flexible grouping is essential during guided reading times. So you might have a, um, you might have a group of students that are reading different level text based on their, uh, their comprehension and their reading development. So we have a couple different um, ways that we can help improve strategies for reading comprehension. So we've got them listed right here, but I'm gonna go into more detail into each one of them. And something else that you can do uh, with these strategies is add a gesture to them so that it helps remind children to use that skill as we're reading. So the first one's going to be making connections. So this could be, uh, the gesture for this is just interlocking our fingers because we're making those connections. If you want to have a, a picture graphic as well, um, you might use what's on that screen there using a paper chain. So children comprehend better if they make personal connections as they're reading texts. So how are they identifying with the characters or comparing themselves to events that happen in the story? Um, it could have a text to world where children compare the text they are reading to their everyday lives, but somehow we're making that connection. Again, use that gesture so that when you're uh, working with children that they can either look at that picture or your gesture so they know what you're talking about. Uh, the next strategy is going to be predicting and inferring. So, um, this one, you can use a, like a magnifying glass or like a crystal ball. So we're looking into something. So your gesture could be uh, making that, that crystal ball with your hands or looking through a magnifying glass, um, but you can also use the picture as well. So children enjoy predicting what's gonna happen in a story based on just the title or the first couple pages. So when you start a new story, have them look at the, the cover of the book and predict what they think is gonna happen or um, let them flip through the pages and look at the pictures and decide what they think is going to happen in the story. You can even do it as you're reading along. So, okay, well, this happened and this happened. So what do you think is gonna happen next? 
giving them that chance to predict and infer um, is a great way to help build that, that reading comprehension. The third way is going to be questioning. Um, this one, we're going to form a fist and pretend it is a microphone. So we want children to ask questions. What questions might they be thinking about as they're reading the story to help them understand it better? Maybe you've gotten to a part and it's really not making a lot of sense, but as a teacher asks questions aloud, it makes the children to start to understand, oh, I get what we're talking about. And it's modeling how we can um, be thinking about questions on our own. The next one is monitoring and clarifying. For this one, we want to pretend to have glasses. So we can have our, put our glasses eyes on as our gesture. Um, so in this one, we want to make sure that we are using our strategies of monitoring and clarifying to make sure that we are understanding what we read. So maybe if I read a page, I go back and I think, okay, now what was happening in this story again? And making sure that we truly do understand what we're reading. The next thing is going to be summarizing and synthesizing. And so this one you can use as a lasso. We're lassoing up and throwing it and pulling it back. So again, we have that, that gesture that goes along with it. Summarizing is a really difficult strategy for young children. So they must learn to distinguish between the main ideas and all those little details leading up to it. So this can help by sequencing where maybe we have some pictures that we're putting in the right order of main events that happen in our story to help us summarize. Um, using graphic organizers as well will help us understand the main idea, the main events that happen in a story besides just all those little bitty things. The last thing is going to be um, evaluating and for this our gesture is just going to be like a gavel. We're hitting it on uh, on the gavel block. Um, and so evaluating is a high level comprehension skill and strategy that involves analyzing and making judgments. Um, so again, this can be very difficult for young children. So um, readers evaluate what they thought about the story, character decisions and actions. They should practice using evidence for the text to justify their answers and opinions. So this might be um, you as the, as the teacher asking more detailed questions about, okay, well, you thought that that was gonna happen, but how did you know? What happened in the story that made that happen? Um, so you're really getting to them to think about how they're coming up with their answers. So there's a lot of uh, things that go into motivation for early literacy engagement. Um, you have to have that motivation for people to want to do it, for children to want to, to participate. So when we're thinking especially about early literacy, we need to think about enjoyment. Children need to enjoy reading. So what are ways that I can make my um, reading and making children read and reading times enjoyable for the children. So um, there's lots of different ways that I can do that. We're going to be talking about them in just a, a second. Um, but I do want you to also know that reading illustrations are just as important to teach young readers. So not only do they, we need to have the comprehension in the words, but they also need to be able to read the pictures and the illustrations. So sometimes talking about the basic elements of art, um, in your book, there's a figure there of different visual um, art elements, definitions and illustrations. So those are some of the words that, vocabulary words that we can use when talking about drawings. It also means that I need to choose really good children's literature, that it's not just the story, but also the illustrations, because children use a lot of those illustrations to help them understand what that book is about especially in the early childhood years. I need to be able to model reading myself. So I need to model uh, while I'm reading in groups. I need to have them see me reading. I need to have them where I'm going to be thinking aloud so they can see how that reading process and that comprehension goes. Um, I have to model appropriate behavior. So making sure me as the teacher and I'm sharing also with families how they can promote reading at home so they see the reading happen. Another way to motivate early literacy engagement is going to be by choosing appropriate books. Um, earlier we talked about how um, we choose vocabulary uh, or vocabulary is decided based on 
Um, you can do some assessments to figure out what level children are on. We need to make sure children are reading appropriate books as well so that they are able to not be frustrated and be able to be successful in what they're reading. So a great way to do this is that five finger rule. So um, maybe a child chooses a story and they uh, open up to a page and they look through that page and for every word they don't know, they hold up a finger. If they get to five in one book on one page or maybe it's a book that doesn't have a lot of words, so we do the two page spread, um, then that book is going to be a little bit too difficult for that child. So we're gonna go ahead and put that book away and have them choose a different story. So that way a child is able to self-regulate what an appropriate book is. Um, so again, here is a bunch more ways that we can have children become motivated for literacy engagement. But I also have a video to share with you to help engage nonfiction readers. So let's take a look at that. It might take a second to load. If a change in the weather is coming, these students at Roslyn Heights Elementary School will be among the first to know it. There's no wind, there's no wind, and the wind Ooh. is sort of blowing. Ooh. Hey! It's, uh, the, temperature, oh, the temperature, the temperature is about 30. These kids are becoming avid readers, and not just of thermometers and barometers. Hey, you guys, it's time to go back to class. <laughs> So I have got this really great book, and it's called Storm Chasers. Teacher Margaret Barnes uses a framework called Pori to teach reading comprehension skills to second and third graders. Pori, developed by Dr. John Guthrie, stands for concept-oriented reading instruction. Organized mostly around nonfiction books, each 18-week reading unit guides kids to come up with their own questions, dig up facts, integrate the findings, and share the highlights with the class. And when they go over the water, they turn into water spouts. Students pursue their own interests with hands-on experiences, which research shows boosts motivation more than, say, simply looking at pictures. Kids are also encouraged to ask their own questions. The questions I'm trying to answer are, um, cloud questions. My first one is, how many clouds are there and how do clouds float? Key to Cory is a large collection of irresistible books, from haikus to history. I like to have a lot of books to choose from so that I can get information, but it's hard to choose from because there's so many, and I like tornado books, but I have to look at cloud books so that I can get information. We know that choice is one of those intrinsic motivators. Uh, social interaction is an intrinsic motivation. But when children have choice to find their books and then be able to talk with their friends about what they found, and maybe, maybe someone will share, hey, I found this about tornadoes. Why don't you read this book? And they can recommend a book. Then it, that just lends itself to more engagement. Corey offers explicit strategies for plucking information from a book. By thinking aloud, Ms. Barnes shows kids how to spot the factual diamonds among the less brilliant stones. Whee-o, whee-o, sirens blare. People hurry to a radio or TV and quickly flick it on. Hmm, I wonder why they're doing that. So I'm starting to think about this. As you read, do you think about things? and? kind of start to make questions in your mind. Ms. Barnes has also shown her students how to find information by using an index, glossary, or table of contents. After the students' own questions have been posed and researched, and after the facts have been sifted and connected, kids can then communicate their findings to the class. Our reports from the wacky weather. Did you know it can snow pink snow? Well, it can, because when wind picks up dark pink dust, it carries it to snow clouds, and then it snows pink snow. Being able to communicate to others 
is an aspect of CORI that's important because it validates that children are learning for the sake of learning. And when they ask their own questions and find answers and are able to express that and communicate that to others, it validates that they're a learner, that they're a thinker and a reader and a writer. Nate? Um, did anything break in the farm? Well, I think that the farm got knocked down and stuff, but not those three things. Research shows that Corey works. Kids in Corey classrooms are not only more motivated and curious than those who get traditional instruction, they also score higher on reading achievement and conceptual knowledge. For kids who don't enjoy fiction, many boys don't, Corey offers a new route to reading engagement through nonfiction topics. Corey's impact can last far beyond elementary school. I've watched children's lives change because they may never have thought of themselves as a good reader. It changes the way they see schools, changes the way they see themselves as readers and writers. They remember it always. They remember the experiences they have in Corey classrooms forever. Right. Okay, so there's an example for you. I'll have another video example for you uh, later on. So, uh, comprehension instruction and the Common Core State Standards. So, um, literacy instruction has changed significantly um, in the creation of Common Core Standards. These new standards are designed to prepare kindergarten through 12th um, grade students for college and careers. And so this is something so that um, there are standard things that are being taught, let's say, in first grade across the entire United States. So if you were in a school in California and then you ended up moving over to Wisconsin, um, you should be on the same playing field. So when you move, you don't have this huge gap, depending on what your state or county was doing. Um, so in this, students must be able to read and understand complex texts in multiple genres across the curriculum. So no longer are we just taking a look at uh, reading comprehension where uh, we're reading these Dick and Jane books, um, where it's, we're just reading for words, we're actually reading for comprehension. And so we need to integrate things like nonfiction and fiction into our reading and not just one type of genre. So there's a couple different strategies used in um, the instruction through this, through Common Core. And the first is going to be um, closed reading. Reading comprehension includes the ability to read text, process it, and understand the meaning. Beginning readers interpret text on a literal level, only comprehending the words in the sentences. And comprehension is a creative, interactive process that depends on language skills. The notion of closed reading is critical for the implementation of Common Core standards beginning at the kindergarten level. Closed reading is an instructional routine in which students critically examine a text, especially through repeated readings. So according to um, Douglas and Fisher, um, there are two primary objectives of closed reading. One is to give students opportunities to integrate new textual information with their existing background knowledge or schemata. And then the second one is to expand the essential strategies of readers as they comprehend complex pieces of reading. So through this closed reading, students become familiar with the text through repeated readings over and over again. Um, it, it gives the children a, uh, an opportunity to feel comfortable with the text and confident in reading the texts. Um, and maybe now we can start looking into deeper pieces of the text, maybe the vocabulary or the structure or what the purpose was or those key details. Maybe I can base opinions on them as well. So um, the closed reading, again, is going to be very repetitive. It's going to be um, in, in your instructional routine. And then we're going to be able to use uh, some five key features. So the first feature of these five key features is going to be short passages. So we might look at just two to three paragraphs or uh, pages in a story. And we're going to really take a, a look at those and examine them. We're going to take a look at complex texts. So we're gonna have narrative text with complex characters or points of view. We might have expository text, so different types of text. We're not just looking at one type. Again, we're gonna go across all different genres. Um, we're going to use limited pre-teaching. 
um, because we want to see what a child is able to gain from what they're reading. So they do have their initial, their initial background knowledge, but we might build on it as we read the text instead of doing it all before. Um, again, we have repeated readings. Um, and the different readings might have a different purpose. So the first time we read might just be for enjoyment. The second time might be uh, to pull uh, some certain parts of the story out. Um, we just have different reasons for reading it the multiple times. And then we have the text dependent or explicit questions. So these are going to be those questions that we want students to ask. So in earlier childhood, we might be asking the questions for them to kind of get, remember that metacognition, that thinking about what we're doing. So these five key elements of closed reading are used consistently throughout the lesson to assure comprehension to the text. And it can be um, used again and again, again, through narrative or expository text, um, fiction, nonfiction, all different areas and genres. The next type that we're going to look at that goes along with the Common Core is going to be text complexity and struggling readers. So text complexity is a term that appears frequently in the Common Core standards. This term goes beyond readability, um, which is based on sentence length and syllables and words, but also includes quantitative and qualitative features, such as text structure, text features, um, having index table of contents, maps, all of those kind of things that you might see within reading something, graphics, illustrations, all of those different things help make up the text complexity. So complexity in narrative texts um, might have multiple plot lines, table of contents, embedded illustrations. So it's not just one single focus. We might use character maps. Um, that's a graphic organizer with specific character traits and examples from the text to help readers understand character development. We might even use semantic webs. It's another graphic organizer that helps us illustrate um, meaning of the texts. We could have concept maps. Again, graphic organizers that um, illustrate the relationship between concepts in the texts and other ideas that are presented. Um, so really, a lot of these things that we use for our narrative text are going to be in graphic organizer form. So we can read it, but then we kind of break it apart so that we can understand it better in using a graphic organizer. Um, again, with text complexity in informational text, same things can happen using those graphic organizers to take a look at these different features and really understanding what it is that we are learning more about. Sometimes you can use mentor texts as well, which is going to be like a second text that kind of pairs with it to get more information. So in that video where the children were learning about um, weather, that they had lots of different uh, books to choose from. So they had uh, maybe a book that they used as their primary source, but then they also had other books that they could look at that still supported that, um, that topic. So we've got a couple different strategies that we might look at uh, for using children's literature. And in our book, um, it gives us a couple different examples and we're also gonna show another one from another class. Um, but in order for us to have to uh, encourage, again, that motivation of, of love of literature and using comprehension strategies, we have to really actively involve students. So again, think about things that um, are playful and games that we can play with the concepts so that we really get the children to want to participate in what they're doing, both cognitively, social, emotionally, and physically. Remember that picture um, of the, the boy that we used a couple weeks back where we've got our head, our heart, and then our body movement. We wanna include all of those different things. So a book talk um, might be on a selective theme book or genre where students get to read the books, they get to talk about them, they could um, draw pictures, act things out, but they have a chance to read and then share about what they're, what they're reading. It could even be something that you're adding to a, a puppetry area in your classroom, but it allows children to talk about the books that they're that they're um, reading. Um, jackdaws, now that is something, you might not be familiar with that word, but think about 
props that would help interest somebody in that topic. So maybe we are going to be learning about space. So we have some moon rocks that we've made out of aluminum foil and we have um, some stars that we have put up on our ceiling that glow when we turn off the lights. There are things that get kids interested in it before they even start reading it. So think about um, props or pictures that kids could bring in, things that just get them really interested about that topic. Um, we also have an open mind portrait. Um, so that's going to be something like we're reading a story about a character and then children get to draw that character. So based on the things that were written in the story, and what the children's background knowledge is and their abilities, their pictures are gonna be looking a little bit different, but it gives that child the chance to get to delve into that character and design that character for them. And then again, bring it back to that book talk and let them share it with their friends. Um, and the last one in our book that it talks about is quick write or quick draw. So give the children a chance to draw um, or write about a topic that you're going to be exploring. So even before you get to it, so maybe we're going to be reading again about space. And so I'm going to give children a, an opportunity to show me what they already know about space through writing or drawing first. And again, you always want them to share. Um, so in order for us to have good comprehension strategies, we need to, again, remember that we have to make connections with students and the text. So remember that was, again, the text to the world, the text to self, or text to other text. We have to somehow make that connection. We need to make sure that what we are choosing for children to read is uh, on their reading ability. We don't want them to be frustrated with reading. We want them to be able to develop those skills and hone them in. So in early childhood, it's, again, best for them to be reading on their reading level, and it might be by having different reading groups reading different stories at that time. So we want to make sure that we are being creative and we're engaging with our strategies and our instruction because we want children to really enjoy what they're doing. All right, so let's take a look at this jigsaw method in this classroom. It'll take a second to get started. And we're thinking. So this is just going to be another method that you could use in your classroom. And I want you to think about how you could also use this in early childhood classrooms before we even get to kindergarten. The jigsaw strategy is a cooperative learning strategy that helps children with their reading comprehension. It's a multi-step strategy that involves the use of home groups and expert groups. Before we jump into the classroom though, let's break down all the steps involved. First, students start in their home groups. Each student has a different text, but all readings are related to the same main topic. For example, gardening. Next, they move off to their expert groups which bring together students reading about the same subtopic. So every student studying vegetables would be in the same expert group. By discussing the subtopic together, they can become experts in it. Finally, the expert groups break apart and the students return to their home groups. Now, each of the students is an expert in one area of the main topic, and they can share that information with the students in their home groups. In essence, each student has become a piece of the puzzle and when they come together, they help each other form the big picture. Now that we've seen the graphic representation, let's watch Kathy Doyle and her students put the strategy into action. I want to know what you remember about the jigsaw strategy. Keith? We uh, went to a different home group, and then you remember moving your body to another table. Does anyone remember when you got to that other table and you met with other kids who all read the same thing that you read? What was that group called? Deja? It was called an expert group. An expert group. When you're done with your discussion at your expert group, it's time for you and your expert friends to go ahead and figure out what was the main idea of what I read? 
what are some of the details that I want to report back to my home group? So together you're going to fill out um, a graphic organizer kind of like this. So you guys will all have your own because you will eventually leave that expert group and go off to report to your home group. So the first thing I'm going to give you is a clipboard. So when I call your name and I tell you where you're headed, I'm going to give you four clipboards and they're all ready to go. You are going to use your new text that I'm giving you. There are directions on here if you forget what you're supposed to be doing. It's now time to head off to the home groups. Let's follow Maya, who's going to become the herb expert in her group. In the home groups, each student reads an appropriately leveled text about a different subtopic of gardening, jotting down notes as they go. Maya will cover herbs, Savion will study flowers, and Moya will learn about vegetables. Kathy keeps an eye on kids as they work to make sure they understand the assignment and stay on track. Can you tell me, what did you learn so far? Did you read the first page? Yeah. What did you learn on this first page? I learned on this first page, the first, first page mm -hmm. that um, they use herbs to put spicy food in. So herbs, they're actually called herbs. They use herbs to put spices in food. Why don't you drop that down? Did Next, you know the students are off to their expert groups. There, Maya will get to talk shop with the other students studying herbs. It is time to move to expert groups. So I am going to say a number, because your expert group is a number. Look at the text you are reading, and if you are, if that text says number one, I want you to move here. Look how quickly Moya moved, I love it. And we're off again. In the expert group, the students will ask each other questions and pull out facts from their reading. Most herbs are easy to grow. I learned that sometimes they need water every day. I learned that gardeners plant herbs on Herbs are put in food to spice things up. Let's start working on this. After discussing the topic, students decide what key facts they will report back to their home groups. Kathy has the kids use graphic organizers to help them arrange and remember the information. If that's your main idea, what are some special things about herbs? Do you know? I'll give you a minute to write it down. Well, each of us could use one of um, one of the things off of our well, our the facts that you bring yeah. down. You're right. That's facts. that's true. Each of you could use one of the facts. Did you want to share one, Maya? What's your fact? Well, my fact, I would put down pot plants dry out faster than outside ground. Okay, what about you? What, is, what, is, what are one of the details you'd like to put about that's special about herbs? They need very little care. That is Once their organizers are complete, the students are ready to return to their home groups to report. So the best part of Jigsaw, when we get to come back home, as an expert reporter and report to our group all that we know. So it's time to do this. I wanna remind you that it is your job to actively listen to everyone who reports. Antonio, because I'm actually going to ask you, what did you learn from Virginia? What did you learn from Moya? I want you to go back home and bring with you the graphic organizer is like a poster that will help you report to your group. Green group, go back home. As the final step in Jigsaw, each student teaches the other in their home group about the subtopic they researched. So Maya shares what she's learned about herbs. Cooks use herbs to put spices on food. And the others teach her about growing flowers. It takes over a week to grow flowers. And vegetables. gardening with vegetables. You can grow lettuce, spinach, and tomatoes in your house. As a wrap up, Kathy has the whole class come together and share what they've learned from each other. It's time to move to the carpet in the front to share. Okay? So I'm asking you to move. You don't need to bring anything. Just bring yourselves 
and all your new knowledge is up here. Okay, it's all up here, so you only need yourselves. I really want you to think about what happened in that home group at the end and think, who taught me something? Because this time, I don't want you to tell me something you read. I want you to tell me about something you learned from a reporter, friend. In Growing Herbs, I overheard Isaac say that herbs don't really need much care. Okay, so under Growing Herbs, in this learning community, you heard so much teaching going on. Even though he wasn't herbs. in my group. He wasn't even in your group and you learned something. Herbs don't need much care. And she even credits Isaac for that fact. Antonio? Other gardeners plant flowers for, to feed butterflies, birds, and so flow bees. flowers are sometimes planted to feed. Tell me the difference between annuals and perennials. Did anyone learn about annuals and perennials? Annuals stay for one year and perennials stay for more than one year. Excellent. Deja. When I was reading my book, Growing Vegetables, <coughs> they said on one of the um, pages, they said most, some gardeners say if you grow in your own backyard, it has a better taste. Jigsaw supports students' comprehension and their skills in working together, but it's not without its cost. Jigsaw requires a lot of advanced planning and organization. You saw Ms. Doyle use colors and numbers to help her students navigate themselves around the classroom. She also had to think pretty carefully about the groups that she formed, for their expert groups, but also for their home groups. Teachers could make use of parent volunteers or instructional assistants to help work with each small group and teachers should also think pretty carefully about the reading material that's assigned to each group. Last, you'll want to find a meaningful way for students to pull together all the information they learn from all the experts. One of the main benefits of Jigsaw, however, is that every student is accountable for their work. As an expert, they're accountable by sitting in their small groups and participating in that reading. And then back in the home group, every student is accountable because they're the expert on the material. It's something I think you'll find your students really enjoy. All right, so our video case is not gonna work because um, we have to get logged in to our, um, we're gonna stop sharing, to our MindTap class. But I am gonna go ahead and share my screen again with you um, so that you can see our class. All right, so I just want to, oh, we're in the wrong week right now. Let's go on to week 12. Um, and I just want to remind you that here in week 12, you do have your makeup assignment, which everybody's going to be doing. That will take you straight to the mind tap um, where you do your quiz for viewing this chapter. You also have a journal prompt that you will be completing. Here is the notes, the PowerPoint, and I will also upload this video for you to see here. And I have a couple other resources for you to go along with reading comprehension if you're interested. Reading Rockets, where those videos came from, have great other ideas about reading comprehension and some more help. So I would, um, I would maybe go over there. This is what it looks like. And there's a whole bunch of stuff to go along with reading comprehension so that you can learn more. Well, I hope that you have learned a lot about reading comprehension, and I can't wait to see you again next week. Bye.